Good morning, everyone, again. Before we begin, I would like to mention that our Nest thermostat has been having some issues. For some reason, although it's set at a low temperature, it just kicks off. So if you guys don't hear the, the sound of the, of the motor, if somebody could just press it and just turn it down, and it's very easy to just reset it. So, um, But we are happy that some cool air is coming down. Um, but we are happy that you are here today. And in the lesson, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, we started a study on um, different courts that exist in, um, in our world. One is the court of conscience, and that is the court that um, we use to judge ourselves. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, there in verse 5, Paul says that we should examine ourselves, test ourselves. Um, and we looked uh, we talked a little bit about conscious and um, we realized that just because you have a conscious doesn't mean your conscious is going to lead you in the right path and we saw our conscience as being made to be a continual judge kind of tells us how we're doing whether good or bad so our conscience is that voice inside us that tells us you did something right you did something wrong but it's not enough just to have that conscience it needs to be really um it needs to be really it cannot be trusted trusted until it is trained in the word of god so and our conscience if it is trained on the word of god is just it's just one way that god speaks to us if the word of god dwells in our heart then whatever we do right or wrong we will be able to know if it's right or wrong and our conscience will let us know of that so that is the first lesson that we cover and then last week we talked about the second court which is the court of public opinion. And uh, what we mentioned is that we are judged by others all the time, other judges, whether you like it or not. And guess what? You judge others too, consciously, unconsciously. Um, we certainly have to take you with a grain of salt because sometimes people judge us not according to truthful judgment and people um, judge you sometimes unkindly and unrighteously. Uh, but one way or the other, um, there are times to where you should consider the judgment because we are to live with everyone in a, in a state of peace and um, with integrity and so forth. So um, we talked about this last week. I'm not going to get into, the end, uh, into a lot of detail, but the lesson today, actually, it's about another court that we're going to be judged. And that is uh, actually be judged by God in the court of God, according to God's word. And this is actually my lesson today, which I call it the end of days and the court of God. Because indeed, there will come a day when we will be judged by God. I received the message from a friend that I went to school, to high school, um, back in Romania a couple of weeks ago. And with all this turmoil happening in the world with COVID and then with all kinds of riots and he was so serious and he said you know do you think this is the end of the world but he was so serious um, and you know many people are asking this um, is this the end of the world and he asked me because he know that I am start, I read the Bible and he was very serious do you think and he was kind of thinking that this might be it because this pandemic is worldwide because people are dying worldwide because of the everything that's happening especially in this country being kind of the not kind of the it is the, the the greatest country in the world in terms of power and might and in in every regard economy um so um i told him my opinion that actually no um and you might ask yourself the same thing are we living the last days and um of course nobody knows that day nobody knows that day so nobody can say well um, I know or I don't know uh, but the Bible has given us some indication as to when that day may come and before I go into the actual lesson I would like to um, bring a segue into this idea of how we live in the end of days and I'll just tell you my theory why I believe we're not there yet but of course although we're not there yet to the point that the Lord is gonna come we could be there yet by the virtue of fact that we can die any minute, right? And then it doesn't matter if the Lord comes tomorrow or if he comes in 500 or 1,000 years from now. But I would like to bring a passage to your attention in Matthew chapter 24. Because when my friend told me, asked me, you know, are we living the last days? Is this it? It made me think of a passage in Matthew 24 when Jesus actually is asked the same question. In verse 3, 
There it is written. And by the way, on my slide, as you know, every time you see a red text is the word of Jesus. So verse 3 says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him, to Jesus, privately asking, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus could have said, I'm not going to tell you. But Jesus didn't leave them quite in that obscure darkness. Jesus answers their question. And the way that Jesus answers their question, Jesus also can answer our question if we have the same question. And we can get an idea when, when uh, actually the end of this age may occur. And in verse 4, Jesus answered to them and said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. That has already happened, by the way. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Key is the next couple of passages where Jesus continues and says, For nation would rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. And verse 8 says, All that is the beginning of sorrow. Then he goes to verse 9, which it's really relevant to answer the question whether when is that day going to come in verse 9 he says then then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake that brethren brothers and sisters is an indication when the last day will occur that is when nation will rise against nation and um, you could say, well, we're there already. I don't know about that. It's possible, you know, with wars and China trying to be bigger than U.S. and U.S. trying to dominate. That is, that is, that is uh, relative. Over here, verse 8 says that all these are the beginning of sorrow. Just the beginning. But verse 9 says, then they will deliver you. This is talking about Christians. They will deliver you up to tribulations and kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. What does that mean? That means that there will come a time. I don't know when, maybe next year, maybe in 500 years from now or two years from now, that actually Christians will, it will happen to them what's happening there in verse 9. There will be tribulations where they will kill Christians and they will be hated by all nations for Jesus' sake. Now, here we are in the United States 2020 and I am not seeing that in all over pandemics spread around the world. You may say there are places in the world, there are pockets in the world where you can go and you can be a Christian and you can be shot, killed, maimed, but that's not happening all across the world. Here, and the key is what I'm trying to say, is that we will know it's the end because it's not going to be just some, some nuts trying to kill Christians. This is going to be a concerted effort by world governments that will come together with the intent to persecute and kill Christians. So as long as we have, you like it or you love it, the President of the United States, the, some say the most powerful man on earth, that when a church is burned, they say church burning cannot happen in this country. I'm thinking that, that Christians are not persecuted to the extent that we read here in verse chapter nine, in verse nine. So not only that, but right now, there are many countries in the world that Christians are not killed. Quiet, nobody's coming to kill us. There will come a time where what we're doing right now in this country, if we live to, to be that far, that far, it will be a punishment, punishable by death. And I believe that there will come a time in our future that actually that will occur not just in this country but it will be pandemic in every nation under in in earth it will be this idea of let's persecute and kill christians when that happens i will start thinking that maybe the end is near but are we there yet i don't think so 
So with that, I don't know when it's going to happen. It may happen some years down the line, but I cannot say, because of verse 9, I cannot say in full faith that we are there yet. And that is, by the way, the word of Jesus. So the day of judgment, however, it is a future reality for all men because Jesus says that it's going to happen. So it's not like Jesus speaks something and it occurs. So whether it happens because you end up to live the day when Christians will be persecuted and killed, or whether it can happen because you die and then um, it's going to be, you're going to have the judgment happen upon you. The reality is going to happen for every one of you, for every one of us. We will be judged by God. You cannot escape it. Hebrews chapter 9, 27 says, It is appointed for men to die once, but after comes the judgment. You're going to die. We, read in, we looked earlier in the Bible study today how we all are going to die, right? We're going to be all dust one day. Right now, we're looking very pretty here, dressed, showered up. But one day, we're going to be dirt. So, whenever that day comes, whether it happens tomorrow because we may be hit by a truck, or whether it happens 20 years from now, 50 years from now, make no mistake about it, judgment will come for every single one of us. In Acts chapter 17, 31 actually says that He has appointed a day on which... He will judge the world in righteousness by the men who He has ordained as He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. This is the Word of God. He's, God says that through Jesus, Jesus through Him, everybody's going to be judged. You cannot escape the judgment of God. So that's already been settled. I have a quote by... Um, Wayne Grudem, it's a theologian, apparently he was born in Wisconsin, I was studying about him a little bit, and he made a statement that, that I wanted to share with you. He said that the final judgment will not take place so that God can determine the condition of each person's heart, for he had known the final condition of every heart before time began. Did you know that? That God already knows your final destination, although you still have a part in it that's how God operates and this is not just his statement this is uh, this is reflected in, in, in scripture the fact that we already been predestined and God already knows but still it's in our hands because we do have the ability to ch change our faith if we change our heart but God still knows in the end and then he goes on to say instead the final judgment will take place so that God can display his glory to all mankind by demonstrating his justice and mercy simultaneously so just know that judgment will be an absolute certainty in our future and we have to then in in terms meditate on that and be ready for that day it's just like you having a big exam happening I have an exam happening coming up for my brokers exam and I'm studying for it every night I'm going to bed at 2 o'clock every morning studying for it because I really want to pass it if I don't study for it I'm not gonna pass it I know that so I need to be prepared so the same way that you need to be prepared for a job interview for for an exam for for anything in life that's worth achieving you need to prepare for and more than anything the most important thing in life that we should be prepared we should be prepared for that day when we are stepping into God's presence and we will be judged according to our works. So, in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 17 says there, If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. That's one word that people don't like to talk about, fear. Am I supposed to be fearing, to live in fear? The world tells you, oh, have no fear. You cannot be afraid of anything. Yet, what is the number one commandment? Fear God and keep His commandments. Fear God, keep His commandments. And of course, love God and all that. But you cannot, this, 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 you cannot separate. You cannot be a Christian and not fear God. You have to have this fear in you because... 
you're going to be in front, of the, in front of him one day and you're going to be given account of what you've done. Romans chapter 2, 11 says, For God does not show favoritism. And I love this passage. God doesn't care. God does not care who you are, where you've been. Well, he probably does. I'm sure he does. But in the end, he's not going to take sides. You are who you are. And um, you're going to be judged just the same way that you are. And he's not going to put his hand on the scale. It's not going to be like your, your daddy to say, oh, it's okay, come here, let me give you a hug. You will be judged according to what you did. According to scripture, actually, there's three types of people that will stand before God's judgment. One is those who do not know Christ, you know. The second is the ones who have accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, and they are faithful Christians. And the third category is those who have a form of religion, may call themselves Christians, but they have not really been transformed. And they just live one foot in the world, the other foot in the church. Or they think they want to have a cake and eat it too. And for the last few minutes, I want to spend a little bit of time to studying about this because we can be in one of these categories here. We can be in one of these categories because the judgment will be very different based on which category you are part of. So. First category of people that will be before God is those who do not know Christ. Revelation chapter 22, there it says in verse 11 through 15, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open. I really want everyone to really pay attention to this verse. Because at one point in your future, you will be part of that. John there talks about a time that will happen in our future too. This is when the judgment day comes, when we will be judged. And in this verse it says that, I saw the dead, small and great, we will be there. Standing before God and books were open. Books were open. And then it says that another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Isn't that amazing? That what we have done, what we are doing right now in our life, it is documented somewhere in books that are kept by God, which one day they'll be opened. You realize this? Our life is being recorded. And it's nothing that we've ever done that you can just say, well, this one, let's just not, I don't want this to be in the book. Rip that page. No. Those books will be there and they will be open. And then in verse 13 says that the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades deliver up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, what, according to what? According to his works, according to what they did. Verse 14 says, and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And verse 15 says, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Brethren, I am not saying this to scare you, this is not a very, this is not a very, some you can say it's a very negative passage because it talks about all those that are going to go to hell because your name is not found in the book of life and your name is not in the book of life if you're not a Christian. And as you know, you can be a Christian if you're not faithful, your name can be erased from the book of life. So it is very important for us to have our name be in the book of life so that the second death has no effect on us. Let's please keep this in mind because it is very important for us to know what shall happen. Whether it is going to be in two years from now or in 200 years from now, this is not my opinion. This is the word of God. This is the vision of John where he saw what it will happen on the day of judgment. 
Keep that in mind. John 3, 16. Everybody loves this passage. But they stop at verse 16. You know, it's such a wonderful passage. Very positive passage. I love John 3, 16. But let's read a little bit further down. Because it doesn't stop at 3.16. Jesus continues. In 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, that is so wonderful. Well, let's keep reading. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Okay, I like that too. Verse 18. He who believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. If our deeds are evil, we love darkness more than we love light. And you know, you can believe all you want in John 3.16. But if you don't abide in the light, we will not have the blessings that comes and everybody chants about 3.16. It's conditional. It's not automatic. Just because you believe in Jesus, it's not enough. There's something you need to do. We need to do something about it. If you don't do something about it, we're no different than the demons. The demons believe too. But they don't do. We need to do. There's something that we need to do. So the one that is not a Christian, they will become, they'll come before the, the, the judgment throne of God. Jesus is going to say, well, I don't know you. You're not, in the, you're not written in the book of life. And you're going to go in the lake of fire. That is first category. Make no mistake about it. We cannot preach that philosophy of everybody's going to heaven. Be kumbaya. We're all just going to be happy and going to heaven when we die. Every funeral that you go nowadays, like, oh, they're going to heaven. Oh, they're going to heaven. Everybody going to heaven. Criminal, shot by police. Every, you know, bad guy. You know, I'm not talking just what's happening right now, but everybody that dies, they get a funeral. Oh, he was such a wonderful man. Well, okay, but, you know, he died while he was robbing a store trying to kill somebody yeah his mom will come and say yeah but he was a good boy okay he's gonna go to heaven now not until unless he he really did what god asked him to do so that is the first category of people that will be gathered before god the second is those that truly accepted christ as saviors and this is the christians those who have truly accepted christ as savior and lord should not dread the day of judgment, but rather look for it with confidence. And I, yes, I do say Christians, and I'm not making any excuses for that. It's very politically incorrect to say that only Christians will be saved. Do you know that? It's like, oh, you cannot say that. You mean only Jesus? Salvation only through Him? Yes. It's only one man by whom we can be saved, the man Jesus Christ. Nobody else. There's salvation in nobody else but Christ Jesus. Only Him die for our sins everybody else you name them from a to z they didn't raise from the dead i think we can agree on that they did not die for your sins and if you follow them you will end up exactly where they ended in the grave not risen again you will rise again but not to life if you don't follow christ so keep that in mind john 5 24 says most assuredly i say to you he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. What music to our song, to our ears. To know that if we are in this category, there will be nothing to judge us on. God is going to say to us, you know, the blood of Christ has washed your sins away. Good and faithful servant, enter thou in the joys of thy Lord, and then we will be saved. We will be saved. First John chapter 4, 17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so we are in this world. John, I appreciate you saying, uh, touching on this during the Bible study, because we do have to have boldness. We can't just say, well, I don't know. No, you can know. If you're a faithful child of God, you can come to a place that you really believe that you're going to heaven. 
And we are asked here to have boldness, boldness in the days of judgment. And how we know we're going to have boldness? Well, if love has been perfected in us, it boils down to love. You have love, then the more love you have, the more that boldness will be, will be more, um, more and more, you'll feel, you'll feel more and more bold, I guess, if I can say that, about uh, going into heaven. So think about that. So that is number two. And number three, uh, this is actually the saddest category as far as I'm concerned, is those who have a form of religion, but they have not been transformed. They may, be, they may call themselves Christians. They may go to church even. They may think that they are very religious, but in fact, they will be condemned. Matthew chapter 7, I, I reference this passage quite a bit, where in verse 21, Jesus there says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. But he who what? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's not enough to just say, Lord, Lord. You have to do the will of him, of Jesus. And then verse 22 makes it even more clear. Many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have you not cast demons in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? And obviously those people weren't just bluffing, right? Those people really believed that they did that. And what would Jesus say to them? He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Can you imagine what a disappointment that will be? You think you've been doing so good all your life. And now all of a sudden, sorry. Um, no, you actually have not. Very, very sad. And in all reality, every single one of us is at risk of being in this category if we don't keep the light burning and if we don't keep our eyes in the Word of God and keep our eyes upon Jesus. I have a story actually about um, a drunk who was coming home um, one night after he spent a little extra time in a bar nearby. And as he approached, he, you know, his dog greeted him very happy. That's his dog. Waiting for him as usual, very happy. You know, that's what I love about dogs. No matter what day you had, they're just so happy to see you. And this dog was so happy to see him, and the guy crashed in his bed, passed out. And then, in the middle of the night, the dog started barking. I don't know if you have a dog like that. I have a dog like that. Drives me crazy, okay? Yeah, drives me crazy. But now we got a collar, you know? Very cool. When he barks, you just press the button, and then they start barking. But this is very different. It's very different because listen to me because I'm foolish too when it comes to this because he barks sometimes. I don't know why he barks. But for this particular drunk person, in the middle of the night, his dog started barking and the man didn't want to miss the night's sleep. Got up, you know, yelled at the dog as you can imagine. He was so drunk and, you know, took a chair, threw it at the dog. The dog stopped. And in the morning, the guy got up and he found that his house was being uh, burglarized. And he found a broken chair and a dead dog and everything in his house was missing because he was stolen. So the dog was really trying to, his best friend was really trying to warn him, but he silenced the dog. Um, and then um, we know what happened with him. Very sad. But you know what we do in our life as Christians, often we do the same thing. Because Jesus is really our best friend trying to warn you, try to advise you. But then we don't listen. Snooze the button. Snooze. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to. I'm not going to do that. You don't listen. You don't listen. You don't listen. And then comes the judgment day. Then comes the judgment day. So keep that in mind. Sometimes we just have other things to do or we don't want to be disturbed like this man in the, in the story just want to sleep. I don't want to wake up. Whatever. Whoever it is, I don't want to talk to him. So don't silence the Holy Spirit in your life. We need to listen to Him. Listen to Him and do what it says, whether you like it or not. Romans 2.13 says, For it is not the hearers of the law who will be judged as having righteousness before God, but the doers. I don't think I've mentioned this passage very often, but it's such a powerful passage. And it makes it so clear is that is that it's not the hearers of the law. If you just hear the law, you, you are missing the point. It's the doer. 
of the law that will be judge whether or not you did it if you're just a hearer you're just wasting your time so let's make sure that we are the doers not just the hearers you can doctor you're outside with religion you can fit yourself up you know everybody looks at you they see you like a good christian but if inside of you you're not what what god believes you should be or what you even know that you should be um it's not going to bode well in the day of judgment for, for us if we are like that. So when God looks into your heart, what does he see? Does he see what I see, what everybody sees? Or he sees something maybe that he, you see that it maybe is not so favorable. Think about that. So does he see a transformed person? So how can we tell if our lives have been transformed, by the way? Think about that. Okay, my life has been transformed. How has it been, been transformed? The word is, the answer is fruit. Do you have fruit? If you don't have fruit, your life is not transformed. If you have fruit, that's awesome. I have the parable here of the barren fig tree. Jesus again speaking. And then make no mistake about it, that Jesus here is speaking to us as well. This is not just for his disciples, it's for us as well. In verse 6, Jesus there also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not after that, you can cut it down. The moral of this parable here is that the tree there is us, it's Christians. If we don't bring fruit, the Lord is going to be long suffering is going to give you a little bit of time a little bit of time a little bit of time but eventually time's up and then okay it's over cut it down i've been telling you that i have a tree in my backyard two lemon trees in my backyard one gives so much lemons we cannot even keep up with it the other one every season gives like four lemons five lemons the other one gives like 200 and every year, like, do I cut it? Do I not? It's like, oh, okay. I would have cut it if I really had the time, but I just leave it there. Give it fertilizer. She gets the same water and everybody, just like everybody else, just like doesn't produce. One day, maybe I will have to cut it down. But that is us right there. And that tree right there, if it's us with no fruit, one day we will be cut. And it should be no surprise to all of us if we will be cut. In conclusion, we saw a couple of weeks ago that we can stifle the judgment of conscience. Last week we saw that we can ignore if we wish the court a public opinion. If you don't like what others say, who cares in the end? But you cannot ignore the supreme court of God. Every one of us will be present when Jesus announces that it's time for the final judgment. You cannot say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to participate. You're going to be brought in his presence and you have no say in it. Every single one of us, whether you're a Christian, whether you're not, whether you've been baptized, whether you've been saved, whether you haven't been saved, we all are going to present in his presence. And for those who live by the gospel, it will be a time of joy, but for many, it will be a time of indeed terror. And I want to encourage you that you ponder on that, all of us. I would like to end today's lesson with um, a story of a boy. After this illustration, the lesson is yours. A boy was playing around the lake one day when he fell into the water over his head and then he couldn't swim and he started screaming and being afraid and a man on the edge of the water jumped in it and, and rescued him, brought him out and saved him. Um, and then as the year passed, that young boy grew up to be a, not a very nice person, like a criminal, didn't like to, didn't like to be a 
useful member of the society. He got in with the law, a little bit in trouble with the law. And then when he got to the courtroom, approached the judge seat, he recognized that it's the same man, the judge, that rescued him, that saved him when he was a kid. And he said, Your Honor, you do you remember me? You saved me when I was a kid. He said, Okay, this is probably going to be nice to me now because he knows me. And the judge said, You know, then I was your savior, but now I'm your judge. Now I am your judge. And you know what, brothers and sisters? Jesus came to this earth to be our savior, but when he comes back, he will be our judge. But wait, Jesus, you're my savior. No, now I'm a judge. So think about that. If the Lord were to call you in his courtroom today, my challenge to you and my last question to you, if he would give you a verdict, what would that verdict be? Would he count you faithful? Or we find so much, so much bad stuff in your heart that you may not pass the test. What would it be? Because don't make no mistake about it. When he comes back, he will judge you. He will judge me and he will judge all of us. So this brings my lesson to a close. But we always, as we have the habit, we don't leave it here. We want to invite you to really, if you find yourself in a place right now that your life is not right with God, whether it's because you may be a Christian, but there's things in your life that are secret that you keep only for yourself and only you know, those will be revealed one day, by the way. Uh, we challenge you to, to make things right with God today because, yes, we might not live the last days, as I mentioned in my introductory statements. Um, you can die tomorrow. You can die this afternoon. And then you will be presenting before God. So I'm challenging you. If you are a Christian, but there's something you need to do to change, I'm encouraging you to do what you need to do so you can be ready and prepared. And if you're not a Christian, if you have not obeyed the gospel, if you have not been baptized for the forgiveness of sins, your name is not written in the book of life. And we encourage you to put your name in the book of life before it's too late. And if we can help you with that, please come forward. And even now we can do with no delay as we stand and as Bradley will lead us in the closing song.